Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone out there. My name is Sandy Campbell. I'm the executive director of the Santa Fe Council on International Relations. Welcome to week four of Journalism Under Fire. What an amazing journey it's been so far. We, of course, have had 24 live streams so far. We have six more to go this week. Uh, if you missed any of those 24, they're all up on our YouTube channel uh, within about an hour or two of every panel concluding. Uh, and they're also available on our website, journalismunderfire.org. This week we have six, as I mentioned. Uh, later today, we're going to go back into the world of the political cartoonist. We have the amazing Ann Telnes, the political cartoonist, uh, Pulitzer winner from the Washington Post, uh, and Cal, who's the political cartoonist for The Economist and the Baltimore Sun. They, of course, were here in 2018, gave a fantastic set of presentations. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, we have some incredible cartoons lined up to show you, and we're really gonna walk through some of the process that these cartoonists go through in coming up with what they come up with. Uh, then tomorrow, we're going to go to visit a few of the world's uh, rainforests and understand how some collaboration is really helping to document and understand some of the crises these rainforests are in. Tomorrow night, we're going to travel to Brazil, and we're going to have an amazing talk with the journalist uh, Patricia Campos Mello, who is a, who is a force uh, in Brazil. And she's going to be interviewed by Courtney Ratch, who's the advocacy director for the Committee to Protect Journalists, and absolutely brilliant. Thursday night, of course, is our biggest talk yet. Uh, we will feature Bob Woodward and Peter Baker and Dana Priest and Joel Simon, also from CPJ. Um, and then for those of you with an all-conference ticket, uh, on Friday, of course, at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, we are going to sit with Dana Priest and ask questions and reflect on the conference and reflect on what we've learned. On that very point, I really want to encourage all of you out there to send us you know, one thing that you've learned or one thing that really jumps out at you from attending these various streams. We will be putting together a learning document that captures uh, all the different things that people had to say and, and some of the amazing perspectives that we've been able to learn from. And we want your perspective too. So send us in your things that you've learned, send it to evaluation at sfcir.org, or you can send it to me directly at sandy at sfcir.org. Uh, so help us make this learning from this conference as robust and as comprehensive as possible. Before we get to today's panel, let me remind you all today's Giving Tuesday, and we hope that you all uh, can celebrate you know, your favorite nonprofit uh, by, uh, by a small donation. Of course, a great way to give uh, to CIR is to give the gift of membership to, uh, to your loved ones, to your friends, to people you know would be interested in joining you know, the many conversations we have, the many special events we have for our members. Uh, um, it's, it's a great way to celebrate the holiday season by giving something to somebody else and then of course supporting us. All of our membership dollars go to support our global education programs in high schools and colleges. So your gift goes an awfully long way. So on that note, let me introduce today's moderator, Inez Russell Gomez. Welcome Inez, it's great to see you. Hello, hello. Inez of course is the editorial page editor for the Santa Fe New Mexican. I'm sure many, uh, uh, many of you out there have sent her a note or two over the years, but uh, Inez does one amazing thing. She does many amazing things, but one particular amazing thing I wanna talk about right now is Inez regularly meets with our international journalists when we bring them here to Santa Fe through our State Department connection. So Inez, first, thank you for doing that. And secondly, what are some, what, how is that experience for you? What jumps out at you from, from getting to speak, you know, directly to, to folks from really every corner of the world? I think I'm always amazed and a little ashamed uh, that they know so much about us and we know so little about them. And you really feel the weight of what's happening in the United States uh, as it affects the rest of the world. You know, especially over the last four years of the Trump presidency, you have people coming to your newsroom who the president has called their countries, you know, using uh, expletives. And you have to look at them and say, well, I didn't do that. And they're like, well, it's a democracy. You guys voted for him. And it's uh, really humbling. And I always learn so much more from the journalists who visit our newsroom, um, especially the way they understand press freedom versus the way we understand it, the way they have to deal with their governments, and just how really intelligent and dedicated they are. 
And I've enjoyed that probably as much as any part of my job uh, over the last few years. And, and I think back to the last group that we had, it was the beginning of March, 2020, and it was right before the world went into uh, pandemic mode. So it was, a, it was an interesting farewell. Yes. And it'll be certainly interesting to have them come back and talk to us about how pandemic has shaped journalism in their various different countries and all the ways in which we've learned from that in both positive and, and troubling ways. Yep, definitely. Well, let me invite the rest of the panelists to uh, click on their videos. And I'll just remind uh, folks in the audience to uh, ask your questions in the Q&A panel, and we will get to them uh, towards uh, the end of the program in about uh, 40 minutes or so. So Inez, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome to all our panelists and uh, looking forward to a great discussion. All right. Thank you. And uh, um, we're excited to be here. So thank you guys, everyone who's watching for joining our panel covering crisis in the newsroom. Um, as Sandy said, I am the editorial page editor of the Santa Fe New Mexican, which for those of you who don't live in our area, it is an independent locally owned daily newspaper publishing from the capital of New Mexico. Uh, we've been putting out a paper here since 1849. It's one of the oldest paper, if not the oldest papers in the West. And that means we have seen plenty of crises over the years. And that can include civil war battles outside of our town, covering Billy the Kid, the outlaw, and the atom bomb in Los Alamos. It's an interesting journey for everyone who's worked uh, in journalism, I think. And 2020, though, to me, seems as though it's in a category all its own. Uh, the crises are plenty. They never stop. And we began the year with the president facing an impeachment trial, went into the pandemic, had riots in the streets, racial injustice, climate change induced hurricanes and forest fires. And through it all, we have newsrooms whose job it is to make sense of all that's going on. And that's what we'll be talking about with our panelists. We have uh, with us today, Tina Sussman, senior editor at Time Magazine. She has 25 years of experience as an editor and reporter, including working in Africa and Iraq. And she once was the Baghdad bureau chief of the Los Angeles Times, and now directs reporters covering all of these different crises all over the country. Um, Jennifer Ludman, Ludden is energy and environment editor for NPR News. She's in charge of covering a slow moving crisis, the climate change uh, that we all are dealing with. So she directs NPR staffers, public radio reporters across the country, tracking the changing energy landscape and how communities are coping with climate change. We've seen in California with the wildfires, coping is getting pretty difficult these days. And then there's Pervez Shawani, who's a senior editor at CNN. He runs investigative reporter teams, enterprise reporters, but he also has expertise on beat reporting when it comes to policing. And I'd like to hear from him about his thoughts on that crisis, which has led to riots in our streets, because for whatever reason, we keep having conflicts between civilians and police officers that end up in civilians being shot, often people of color. So that leads us to how do you juggle all of the stories that are going on this year? All of you have years of reporting that have informed your how you assign reporters, how you tell them to deal with things. Um, Tina, how does that personal experience help guide the choices you're making with all of the many priorities that you have to juggle to get the stories out and get reporters where they need to be? Uh, well, thanks for hosting this and thanks to everybody for being here. Um, I think the first tough question, so I hope I will answer this properly, but I think it reminds me now of when I first became a newspaper correspondent in Africa, based in South Africa. Uh, this was after several years of working for the Associated Press. I went from an organization that had reporters all over the continent to an organization, Newsday of New York, which had one reporter, me, based in the entire continent. Basically, the rule was pick your stories and just wrap your arms around them and do the best you can. You know you can't do everything. And I think especially in a year like we've seen, and frankly, a decade like we're seeing, trying to cover absolutely everything with sadly the decrease in staff and the decrease in the actual number of news organizations out there mm -hmm. it, you're just going to run your reporters ragged so at time at least one of my standards is pick your battles and win them and do them really great and just know that you're not going to be able to do absolutely everything the way you would love to be able to do it 
That makes that makes sense. I mean, we have to make choices. That's part of what news, newsrooms do is we curate the news in a sense by what we cover, what we don't cover. Uh, Jennifer, your story, the main beat that you're doing is, is an always changing story. How do you make that immediate when it, it's kind of an incremental story, even though these flashpoints are happening? How does that work for your team? That's definitely a challenge. Um, you know, President Trump has helped a lot. There have been, <laughs> there have been a lot of news pegs. Um, he's been very active in um, deregulating a lot of the climate rules and policies that um, we'd had, you know, mostly from the Obama administration. So that is kind of a constant thread. But really, we try to go into communities. I, I, I know, like, as you said, I work with local member station reporters as well as staffers. and you know, we try to show what people are dealing with on the ground um, in terms of the climate impacts or trying to adapt to them. And, um, you know, and, and covering it as a crisis, I mean, you know, one of the, cri the aspects is that it can be pretty darn depressing. You know, we, as you read the science, you, you know, every report that comes out, wow, <laughs> um, they are, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of spot on. You, we've seen, you know, the changes that were talked about for decades kind of start to happen now. And then you look into the future what they're projecting and it can be pretty um, disheartening. But uh, so, you know, we work in some animal stories to help people get a little feel good. But one of the, this year, you know, our, our team, we obviously, as Tina says, we can't cover it all. But I sit on the national desk where we, we try to do a bit of all of that that's happening. And some of my climate reporters have had to shift to other crises like, the, you know, racial reckoning and, um, and the pandemic. And so it is assigning people to go from one crisis to another and trying to make sure that they don't completely burn out in between and space this out and just think about their well-being. And I, and I think what you had mentioned to Tina, I do remember being in the field and feeling the emotional part of immersing yourself in a difficult story. And you're speaking with people who are going through hard times and just kind of being cognizant that, um, you know, we are all human and we need, we need little breaks and we need little, um, a, a mix of stories now and then when we can. Find some happy stories to do as well. Happy's relative. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, at a couple months in, I thought, gosh, if only we could go back to a place where all I had to worry about every day was climate, <laughs> the climate <laughs> crisis. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Gervais, uh, you came up uh, and had some pretty interesting reporting experience. And I'd like you maybe to talk about what you saw on the ground when you went to Ferguson, which is one of the flashpoints of the past decade when it came to race relations and to policing and how that informs how you assign your reporters now as an editor and, and how you view the stories that come in. I think, you know, one of the things we saw in Ferguson, and for me, it just became sort of the way things played out. I was, I was covering the NYPD at the time uh, and covering uh, what was happening in New York and Eric Garner was happening in New York, but I was also helping out on the national desk covering uh, Ferguson. And so I happened to be in Ferguson the week of Thanksgiving and that the week that uh, the Michael Brown um, uh, grand jury decision came down uh, on the cop. And then the week later was back in New York when the decision came down on Daniel, Daniel Panaleo, the cop in the Eric Garner, uh, the Eric Garner killing. And what you realize is two places aren't the same. But when these policing issues happen, there's this push to make them all seem like they're same. And obviously, there are some similarities in them. One that I think you and I talked about, one that sticks out to me is just the protests afterwards. Um, and the protests afterwards, I remember getting on the ground in, in Ferguson and, and you have, uh, and you have, you know, tear gas coming at you. Um, and, you know, you're, you're sort of dealing with uh, the reaction from police departments to, to the protests there. And then when we returned to New York, um, I remember an editor asked me, he's like, why were the protests in New York so different than the protests? in in ferguson uh and this is very much a, a a very small slice of you know what is a larger picture and larger issues that we have to deal with but in new york they don't use tear gas it's it's a policy that they haven't done for decades because they had an incident in which tear gas ended up leading to something uh, bad and larger and so they just stopped using it uh but two when you're running down the street in ferguson you can hear on both sides of you 
gunshots going off in the neighborhood. In New York, if one gunshot were to go off at a protest, the cops would do the exact same thing and shut it down. But because of the way the gun laws are different in Missouri versus the gun laws are different in New York, it just doesn't ha- it didn't happen. I mean, I guess it could happen. Obviously, there's plenty of shootings that happen in New York, but it just doesn't. And I don't know why it doesn't, but like the situations would be that that's what makes these situations so different. So I think, you know, you obviously need to look at the bigger picture of what is going on, but also realize on a local level what is different than is happening, say, in Minneapolis versus in New York versus in L.A., um, because they are different departments and they've dealt, dealt with policing differently over the last several years. Would you say um, as a commonality, because because part of reporting is you have the flashpoint, you have the, the racial unrest in the street, you have the shooting. But how do you step back from that to try to put it in context as an editor to say what is happening in the training of officers, perhaps, that leads to these confrontations? You know, why does it happen more with people of color versus you know, the, the old saw about Dylan Roof was arrested and they got him a Burger King after the shootings sure. in South Carolina. How do you take time to step back and do those stories as well in the midst of all these crises? I, th- I think there needs to be a checklist in all of these. I think you need to look at training. I think you need to look at uh, police culture. I think you need to look, look at union contracts. Um, and I think a lot of that sort of shapes how police departments work. I think one of the biggest problems that police departments have is, is you know, this culture that they allow that, you know, there isn't, and you see police departments trying to do this. There's been a bunch of police departments that have tried to do this in the wake of George Floyd. And I, and, you know, and as we try to cover that, I was like, don't forget, we, a lot of police departments tried to do this in the wake of Michael, uh, of, uh, of Michael Brown and, and Eric Garner as well, where they're asked, they've created these policies in which they ask police officers who not only are the ones who are doing something bad, uh, to be held accountable, but if you are a police officer on duty with that other police officer who's doing something right. bad, you're also asked to report that. Now, my question is, is that how many of those policies are enforced? You know, I mean, I can think of two that were passed just this year. Buffalo passed a policy just like that, and then the Manhattan Transit Borough Authority uh, that also passed a policy. And I remember our desk being like, oh my God, this is a big deal. And I'm like, it is and it isn't, because this is something that's been going on. It's the same thing with Community policing, you know, I, I, I get a feed every day from Google Alerts that says uh, that's on um, police reform or another one on policing. And I can't tell you how many local newspapers are talking about community policing happening in their in their towns. And I was like, we've been talking about community policing. The NYPD's probably been doing community policing since the 80s or the early 90s. Uh, and, you know, there's some new iteration of it. Uh, and I think you need to get wrap your hands around what community policing means instead of just using it as a buzzword. Right. Uh, and figure out, you know, what's the right way to do, it, what's the wrong way to do it, and ultimately what's success in that place. That makes so. sense. Um, Jennifer, uh, can I say ahead. something? Oh, please, so, yeah, go I ahead. To add on to something Pervasive said. Um, yeah. You know, you and also, and as you mentioned, time, that's something a lot of journalists unfortunately lack nowadays because of the short staffing. Mm-hmm. But I think another issue when it comes to looking more in depth at why this stuff keeps happening with police departments over and over again is. The training issue, people can talk as much as they want about reforming the police, but really what needs to be reformed in so many cases is reforming the training systems. We recently ran a very large story, which is up on our site, looking at how the outsourcing, essentially the privatization of police training, has taken hold across the country. What that means is that thousands of aspiring police officers who can pay a few thousand dollars tuition to go through a private police training program without a job, get a certificate. In some states, it's easier to become a cop than it is to become a barber. And the result is this you know, proliferation of police. Some, I'm sure, are fabulous, but there's no question some are being graduated simply because they could put themselves through school. They get their certificate. They become police officers. It's a it's a huge problem. There is no national oversight over police training. Right. Absolutely no system in this country that says these are the things you must do to become a good cop. And these are the things you should not teach aspiring police officers. So that, I think, is one of the big, I think, one of the biggest issues. But it goes back to your question of where do you find the time to report this? In this case, thankfully, I had a reporter who had the time to report it, but it did take a long time. Wow. That 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 really, I think, shows the importance, though, of reporters to try to put it in context that it's not the point of the shooting. 
It's what led up to it and how do you change what led up to it? And then how do you change the culture of officers who were trained that way forever and ever? Well, exactly, exactly. You can't just untrain them if they have been taught for years by often retired police officers who were also taught that same way. You can't expect these retired cops to suddenly embrace a whole new system of like a guardianship kind of policing as opposed to the more military type policing that so many of them learned. That that makes sense. And there needs to be accountability as well. I mean, there, you know, there's just the, the accountability systems that are in place. Are, are just so weak in so, in, in, in so many police departments. So, yeah. they and a lot of that's written into national and union, you know, uh, and, and local uh, either uh, laws or contracts. So, right, and that that's where the whole union, uh, maybe defund the unions as opposed to defund the police, might be a way to look at it. Um, Jennifer, one of the things that struck me when we talked before the panel is the kind of decisions that editors have to make that. I think seem kind of weight would weigh heavy on one in that you're sending people out to do stories where they might catch a disease that could, you know, change their lives forever. Um, how do you establish protocols uh, now and how does that affect the story uh, formation? We used to all sit around a table in a newsroom to discuss what we were doing and now it's through zoom or by phone or email. Does that make what you're doing a lot different and harder or is it just, the same, only different. T- tell me about how that works. So uh, on the second part of your question, you know, for me, none of the reporters, I'm based in Washington and none of my reporters are. So I'm used to communicating with them on, uh, well, not really so much Zoom. <laughs> now we Zoom a little more, but um, remotely on the phone. And so that did not change. I was a foreign reporter for many years. It's fine by me. The editor, you know, reporter phone relationship works. But uh, yes, sending people out, you know, we still to this day, um, under, under the pandemic, we are operating on a voluntary basis. So we prefer radio reporters want to be out where the action is. You want to capture the sound, much like television. You want to be there and you want to get up close with your microphone when you're speaking with someone. Um, we are going on, you know, if a reporter does not feel comfortable with that right now, we're not going to force them. As time has gone on, we have more and more who are willing and we have a wonderful, wonderful um, security um, person on staff who was brought in before the pandemic, but has been just incredible setting out guidelines. And um, so we now have, it's called a fish pole. You have a long um, mic holder, so you can be six feet away from the person you're interviewing. She has standards about cleaning the mic cover in between each interview. Obviously, you're going to wear, we have uh, N95 masks for staffers. Um, there's other protocol, you know, about traveling. If you're in the you're gonna rent a car and you're going to have a producer and a reporter in the same car, you, you know, lots and lots and lots of standards. And we are asking our member station reporters as well to to abide by this um, so that we you know want to make sure that everyone we send out in working on our behalf is safe and that the people they're interviewing are safe. We also um, I want to say though the newsroom has been incredibly resilient. Um, mm-hmm. We are finding more and more ways to get quality sound remotely, right? Zoom, right. Uh, different apps on your on your smartphone. Uh, there was something on today. Our correspondent in Turkey interviewed someone in Iran over WhatsApp. It was pretty good sound. I mean, the, the technology is real a real friend here, and people are getting creative. But um, we're just, you know, again, it's a real, it's, it's a voluntary effort right now. We're not forcing anyone to get on the flight, but but people want to do their jobs. And, you know, when, when uh, George Floyd happened in Minneapolis, we had a number of staff who went and they wanted to be there. And so far, no one has gotten sick while doing their job. Thank goodness. Pervez, how, how do you guys handle it at CNN in terms of protocols for sending out reporters and what kind of dangers you reasonably expect them to face? I mean, as far as as far as coronavirus goes, there's there's you know there's a whole policy in place for for you know getting clearance for travel and whatnot. Um, and then as far as dangers go, I mean, there there are security teams here who help plan, and each situation is different. So uh, uh, they're assessing assessing the situations before uh, and on the ground as they're there uh, um, when they go out. So okay. I'm not directly involved in a lot of that, so uh, right. I, I can only speak speak vaguely about what we do. Okay, that makes sense. Tina, 
what do you think that you're, you're missing because of the crises? Does that worry you at all that we're so immersed in the big things that the little things that might be adding up to something else that's important, we're, we're not catching? Uh, I would say, I would say it bothers me only because it, this is something, this is, this is something that's been going on for a number of years. Um, you know, I mean, the, the shrinkage of journalism, particularly local journalism has been going on for quite a long time. The, I think the 24 seven news cycle has made big explosive events so much more on everybody's radar as a social media, it becomes harder and harder to pay attention to the clues and the hints that might give you a sense of, hmm, this could be happening and maybe I'm gonna start reporting on it now. I think that's where, I mean, frankly, to me as an editor, and I think I, I'm sure Jennifer and Pervais feel the same way because I know they're both also longtime reporters. I mean, the three of us I've worked, I used to live two blocks away from Jennifer Ludden in Cote d'Ivoire, and we used to work on stories together. And I used to run into Pervais at various crazy news conferences um, with Anthony Weiner here in New York City years ago. But <laughs> I forgot about that one. Oh. Uh, but I think as former reporters, that gives us a lot more ability to understand what what reporters that we manage are going through and help them decide. I mean, I I still think like a reporter, I still act like a reporter. If I spot a little weird little story or event or even notice a, a quote from somebody when I'm reading the, the newspaper or listening to NPR or whatever, I will sometimes, you know, tell my reporter who covers that area, hey, this is really interesting. Let's let's check around and see if there's a, actually a bigger story there, or this is something we really need to keep an eye on. Um, I can't let it bother me because if I did let it bother me, it would be really hard to do my job. I just think you have to just, you know, keep focusing on what you know you can do really well with your resources. And at the same time, at a time of crisis, manage the the dangers that all your reporters are facing. I think one thing that has really improved in journalism, and this is based on what Jennifer and Bervais were just saying about handling the risk, is I think editors and news organizations as a whole are far more cognizant nowadays of the dangers reporters face, and they are better at trying to alleviate those before reporters go into the field. I, when I covered the Ebola outbreak in in Congo, um, which was then known as Zaire, which tells you how long ago that was, in the eight, in the eight nineties, mid nineties, you know, no no editor in New York. I was with the Associated Press. That I, nobody said to me, "Are you sure you want to do this? Do you have a mask?" Not a I, right. not a chance. It was like get on a freaking plane and hope the plane doesn't crash halfway there, and get on the right. ground and report the story. And when I decided I'd had enough reporting the story, I was told, no, you stay there. <laughs> oh. So I'm glad that things have improved to the point where news organizations now, I think, are a lot wiser and they understand. Unfortunately, it's because so many reporters have gotten sick, have been kidnapped, have been killed, um, that I think it's forced news organizations to recognize, you know, these are not superhumans. They are people. They do get kidnapped, they do get sick, they do bleed. And before we just throw them into a big dangerous story, whether it's a disease or whether it's a war, we need to we need to make sure they're ready for it and we're ready for it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, who thinks that when you go to cover the local protest with your camera that someone's going to shoot you with a rubber bullet in the eye and that you're going to be blinded, you know, right. and and that that's something that people have to deal with that reality. Um Jennifer, I, I made a kind of a claim at the beginning that maybe it's not true. I think this year is more crisis filled than most of my journalism career. Uh, would you say that's accurate? And and do you think it's going to settle down anytime soon? <laughs> um, I would totally agree. And boy, I hope so, but I wouldn't bet it. Maybe I wouldn't bet on it. Um, yeah. I, I, again, it's just layers and layers of crises. and. Um, it has been a strain. It has really been a strain. And, you know, they, again, they affect, um, obviously people in this country are being affected by a, a number of these crises that we're covering them. 
but we're also feeling it. And um, I, I feel like, you know, the racial reckoning has resonated in our newsroom. And I think many newsrooms, right? You now have multiple generations as in the workplace generally in a newsroom. Um, the way people get our media and news consumption has changed, right? People are getting news on, on social media from their friends who are sharing, saying this is so great and you know here's something I'm passionate about whatever and and there's been a shift in the media landscape you know when I learned um com, com 101 way back in the 80s before the 90s Tina um you know it, the 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 United States we learned about de generations past when there were you know all kinds of politically tinged media but the U.S. had kind of come to this narrow center of the of the political sphere. And now you had a branching out with the rise of digital media and cable TV. And I feel like that's an, a lot of young people who want to come into the field. Um, there's there are different attitudes. You know, right. we we had very tense conversations in our newsroom about people who didn't understand why they couldn't march. Um, right. right? Yeah. Who, who couldn't understand why can't we put, you know, at hashtag BLM on, on our Twitter, my Twitter feed. And so there's, a, that is an ongoing conversation and there are different attitudes from different generations. We are seeking to preserve our, you know, in journalistic integrity. Um, and people have different ideas about how that's best done. So I feel like these multiple crises, it's not just been about assigning and, and working. It has run through newsrooms as well. I don't know if you guys have had the same experience. Yeah, Hopefully. yeah, it makes sense. Pervez, go ahead. Did you? No, I was saying absolutely. I mean, this was you know this was a large discussion that we had you know back yeah. back in May and in June and how you know how do, how do we address that and had to sort of think about policy. So yes, yeah. and you know I've heard from many of editors' friends who run different news organizations or editors at different news organizations talking about you know how do you deal with this and I think ultimately you know the one thing I always say to reporters is it's like you know protests or not protests just think of your job as as you have such a large megaphone as a journalist in a way that you know do you really need to be at that protest use your voice in a different way to go dig and unearth a story that'll help move you know the needle uh in whichever way it needs to move so no that definitely i, I think one of the the crises that's sort of underlying everything is that we can't agree on the same set of facts. We are being challenged by readers and listeners and viewers in ways that are unusual. I mean, I never had to go to a protest before or to a even a speech and have someone yell at me and tell me I'm fake media the way reporters do today. And while you want to be objective, however that plays out, how do you, Tina, I'll go to you, Tina, um, how do you be objective when one side is lying all the time, perhaps, or you think it's lying? H how do you work that out? You know, is there a both side when one side's not telling the truth? I, I, I think the idea of giving equal weight to such disparate sides, especially when science and so many other things prove that one side is lying. No, I'm happy to report. I think that's gone by the wayside in a lot of news organizations. I mean, I'm sure all three of us remember in 2016 during the campaign where there were discussions in the newsroom at that time I was at BuzzFeed News, like, well, should we, are we allowed to say lie? Can we call this a lie or should we call it something right. else? Therefore, you ended up with all these fancy ways of saying lying. Um, I think nowadays you probably see the word lie quite a bit. I think for me, the main the main thing I tell reporters is number one, don't try to get into an argument with somebody who's accusing you of fake news. It's not going to work. It's just going to keep on going and no elevate and get nastier and nastier. I think the best you can do is just report the heck out of everything. And you know, if anything, I as an editor have become far more rigid about the idea of requiring when people are expressing opinions and stories they must we must have their names if you know whether it's that story about that we published a couple of weeks back on the police training issue or i stories about gun violence what have you or education i always say to the reporter every time you go with an unnamed source 
every time you, you know, if somebody wants to like use a fake name because they don't want to be identified, that gives an audience more ammunition to accuse you of making things up. And I think that that's such a big battle now fighting against this fake news thing that's taken hold. Um, thankfully at time we, we have fact checking. I mean, the stories that my reporters do are fact checked incredibly rigorously. I saw one of the questions coming in our Q and A that kind of refers to how do you, as an editor, if you're not on the ground with your reporter, make sure that their stuff is accurate. Fact checking. I mean, our fact checkers will literally call sources in the stories to make sure, did you say this? Or they will listen to the recordings of interviews, um, document everything. You know, uh, we, if, if somebody accuses the police of misconduct and files a formal report, I always say, let's see the report, get, get a copy of that document so that we can see it. I want to be absolutely certain that we're accurate. I don't think that you can necessarily change many minds if they are determined to claim that the media are full of are just reporting fake news. But I do think that this is a time when you can start to reach the younger minds that haven't yet started kind of absorbing just one side media or another. And so that's that's my goal in the stories that I edit. Can I just jump in? I feel like like climate denial was fake news before fake news was a thing. Yeah. And, you know, years ago, before my time on the beat, NPR just, you know, did, as you said, did away with the false equivalency, the two sides and like it's it's real and we're reporting on it. And I think this is where we, you know, again, with time and people on the ground, you can do a whole story on climate change without saying climate change, frankly. You can do a racial reckoning without talking about discrimination, you know. Uh, you can show to, to get on the ground and show people's lived experiences and hear from real people and their thoughts and emotions and what 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 they're going through, I think, is just the most powerful. It's storytelling that uh, people can draw their own conclusions and they can hear from real voices um, just like them around the country and the world. Um, Pervez, how do you deal with just being, are you, maybe you're not anxious, but how do you deal just as a journalist with all the pressures on you and then helping your reporters get through that? Is that something that worries you? Or Boy, I mean, it's like, it's, the story's changing so much all the time. And it's just mm -hmm. like, you know, you, you think you have your hands wrapped around it at one point, And then the next thing you know, you don't have your hands wrapped around it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think you're constantly dealing with those pressures. And then on top of that, you know, we're dealing with, TV as well as digital and making sure that, you know, we're getting the story, what both need to make sure that the, you know, this, that, that they get a complete story in order for either the viewer or the reader to have uh, a complete understanding of what's going on. So yes, there's, there's anxiety going on all the time. And, you know, and, and the days are long. I mean, you know, during the racial reckoning, the days were, days were long during, you know, the election, the last month, the days are long. I mean, it's, it's it's I, I don't know what it is like for Tina and, and Jennifer, but uh, uh, I don't think it's unheard of for journalists these days to be working 12 or 15 hour days. You know? And that's that's pretty standard. I can only imagine as a foreign reporter, especially you know, there. You're probably working for days on end before before you're getting to rest sometimes. So. And what always boggles my mind is they work all day, write their stories and then they all have to go on television at night. It just seems a little exhausting. <laughs> Jennifer, how do you balance? what well, you're you know, and the reporters everything it's easier for me than them i mean we you know with the the news cycle just it, it, it changing so fast we um mm -hmm. so when uh, soon after president trump came in and we realized well, we we tried hard not to cover the tweets um my husband helps with standards at, he's also with npr and i hear some of the late night conversations and all and you know, for a while, we're like, we don't have to, that's a tweet. That's not, it's not a, you know, not a policy thing. And then we realized actually it is mm -hmm. our Washington desk. Uh, we had to hire up, right. They assigned permanent morning shift and evening shift. The morning shift has to be ready to jump on the air live at 5. AM when morning yeah. edition starts and then update as needed. And then the afternoon person, the White House reporter would be ready to the evening tweet <laughs> and updates as needed. Um, you also have, you know, other news. Uh, we, our shows are doing more live um, because news changes so quickly. 
this can mean one of my main climate reporters is based in the West, on the West Coast. And so if he's doing um, our, you know, uh, we have a podcast as well that goes in our first segment of Morning Edition, that's 2.15 in the morning Pacific time. Ah. And that's a, that's a killer. And that, that means that rest of that day, you know, maybe he can work half the day. He's not going to file for our evening news show like that. Um, you know, it, it, it is a, a huge resource strain. Um, so we, and, and, you know, the Washington desk beefed up a bit, the rest of the newsroom hasn't quite as much. So it's, it's just, um, we're stretched thin people do long hours. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's tough. So, you know, I, I have some long hours. Usually like I have some reporters that real, an amazing team, Alaska's energy desk, wow, four to five hours behind Eastern time, depending. And, um, darn those rollbacks always seem to happen late in the day and then I'm having a late night but um you know it, it, my schedule is much easier than the reporters so yeah Tina what about you what kind of accommodations do you have to make for all that's going on and the fact that news cycles are 24 7 and it's the magazine the web and everything else you do uh you know, it's always a question of juggling wherever you are in the world and whatever job you have. Jennifer just said something, though, that really resonated. It's a lot easier being an editor than a reporter at a time like this. Um, uh, even as a reporter, I, I just always was very clear about, about setting a schedule for myself each day, even in Iraq, where my editors were in Los Angeles. That was an 11-hour time difference. I spent two and a half years basically working 18 to 19 hours a day. If I got three hours sleep in Baghdad, that was considered like great. I felt guilty if I slept five hours. Um, I think now, because I remember what that was like and what it does to you over time, uh, I, I'm really clear with my reporters on deadlines. I think most reporters work best with a deadline. And I will say to them, okay, let's get this done by, you know, 7 p.m. tonight. And then, I mean, I just plan ahead. I'm always planning ahead because I know so well from this last four or five years, you can never assume that any day is going to be a calm day. And you just always anticipate disaster. That's kind of what Jennifer and I used to do when we were foreign correspondents. Always right. assume the sky is going to fall and plan A is going to go right down the drain. So you just plan ahead. You say, okay, I want this done by this time, even though it doesn't necessarily have to be done by that time. That way, if tomorrow turns out to be, you know, chaos, I will have this done. And then if tomorrow is not chaos, it will give me some breathing room. And that, that is one of the joys of working from home, I got to say. You do get that more freedom, I think, to plan a schedule for yourself and work around whatever crazy eruptions might occur, whatever time of the day or night. And I do try to really reinforce that with my reporters because I can't do my job unless they're doing their job well. And they can't do their job well unless I'm actually giving them advice and enabling them to do their job. And energy. An editor told me once long ago, I think I was sick in Zaire in Kinshasa and I was supposed to do some story. And she said, well, you know, if you don't have the energy, you don't have it. You need, and, and I thought, huh, and realized she was right. And I started feeling better. I said, okay. <laughs> and I went and did it, but it, it is, you have, the reporters have to have that driving energy to do their best work. Yeah. You have to be enthusiastic. You want to just get up right. and, and do it. And if you have an editor and I'm sure we've all worked with different types, types of editors, I've had fantastic editors and I have had some editors who just seem to forget that I actually did need to sleep and have a bit of a life. And um, makes them, you know, over time, that latter type of editor, just you kind of get to a point where you're like, why the heck should I work another straight weekend? I've been doing it nonstop and they don't really seem to care. So forget it. I'm not going to answer my phone now. And I don't want any of my reporters to get that way. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the big differences is that you're so available all the time. You know, back in the days when you sent a story by fax or something, when there weren't, I mean, I, I'm old enough, we didn't have laptops when I started out. We called in stories from the road by the phone. Sure. Because I don't even know if they had fax machines. And it, it's a completely different deal. You're, you're just 24-7. They can get you. They want you. They want you to change it. And, and it's a different world. But 
it is now 1045, so we can take some questions. So um, from Barbara Chatterjee, this will be for Purvey's, um, talk about how you think police training could be covered in more depth. Uh, Tina talked about how they did it at time, um, but she wants to know how various events could become teachable moments. So rather than repeating, let's say, the video footage of the shooting or the beating or whatever happened, could you uh, explore the problems in the training and go more into how we got to the point of whatever happened? Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, you need to get a hold of the police training manuals. Uh, okay. Some places it's easy to get them. Some places I think it's harder to get them. Um, two, I think the people who are very instructive are, if you can find the former training chief, you know, there's got to be some former training chief who's retired or, you know, whoever they brought in to work with them you know there's a lot of police departments will bring in outside uh training organizations uh or or team up with uh with 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 you know national sort of leaders in in, in training to do that i think a lot of uh, of departments also follow things like what the national association of police chiefs uh suggest or something like uh perf which is the police executive research forum suggests so it's good to reach out to those to see, you know, sort of what best practices are on those and uh, and uh, team those up against uh, what those policies are that they have. Um, and then, you know, there is definitely some expert out there who, you know, has. I think one of the things and this is just a side note here, I think sometimes we get caught up on looking for expert, experts who are national experts. And I think mm -hmm. people forget that there are local experts either in your county or in your state who have a much better understanding of how policing works on the ground where you are versus like, you know, somebody sitting in DC or New York. Um, so look for those people and then have them walk you through the video and say, this went right or this didn't go right. I mean, there's some retired police chief who has an understanding of what was supposed to happen and what didn't happen. Makes sense. Yeah. Tom Johnson asks again about police training and maybe Tina, you could speak to this. Who has had success in getting those manuals, the training manuals that Pervez was just talking about. Um, he mentions there's zero success in New Mexico, although we did do a story at our paper a few years back that went into the training at the State Police Academy that went into some of the warrior mentality lessons that were being taught that were probably not the best practices. But in, in your reporting, did you find how they were trained and get into those details, Tina? It was extremely difficult. And once again, this goes back to the fact that there is no national oversight of this. Every state can make up its own rules in terms of what's going to be taught. Um, the reporter spent months in between doing other stories, filing FOIA requests, uh, calling police departments all over the country, asking for training records. Um, a couple of times we basically, I think, got our lawyer to, to send a letter to a couple of police departments saying, actually, the law says you do have to provide this information. It's extremely difficult. One thing that she discovered, and which is in the story, is that a lot of police departments um, that use some of these private academies or independent academies uh, just couldn't track down the, the information or the record on where certain police officers who'd been involved in notorious situations had been trained. Uh, so once again, it goes back to the time. I mean, so many newsrooms now have pol have people whose beat is policing. And that's such a massive beat. I think mm -hmm. in an ideal world, we would have at least one person just covering actual day-to-day -day policing. And we'd have another person whose job was just to, you know, focus on police training issues. And uh, because in every state, you know, not well not every single state actually the state of washington is one that does have just one state run police training academy which is viewed by a lot of experts as you know kind of the gold standard in this regard but i mean there was a story recently that I, I think it was a high school newspaper in kentucky broke about a police training pro i think it was a private police training academy i'm not absolutely certain on that that um just in the last few years had had used quotes from Hitler in its training manual. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that, these are stories that aren't necessarily out there. They're not just gonna fall from the sky into your lap. They need people right. who are going to dig and dig and dig and, and have the time to dig and dig and dig. Um, Jennifer, this is uh, going back to a question Tina a little bit addressed, but 
I think it's always a worry for editors. How do we check and question the accuracy of commonalities in a story when we aren't on the ground ourselves? And, and this came from Richard Moriarty. Uh, I, you know, fact checking. Yeah, you, you, you do have a degree of, you need a degree of trust with your local reporter. Um, and, and I have, you know, people who are very, very well versed in their beat. They know so much more about like the local energy policy and all than I do. But I think that, um, I ask a lot of questions, you know, I, I will ask to see something sometimes and explaining, look, I'm not, I'm not necessarily doubting you. I just want to see this Are you know, are we sure? Are you sure? I will just ask if it feels a little, um, mm -hmm. if there's just something inside me that goes, Hmm, you know, we'll, we'll just talk about it. Um, Sometimes also it's beyond fact checking. There are ways of phrasing that might um, sound editorial or might convey. Uh, you know, I want to make sure I'm uh, I'm understanding what they mean to say. It could be interpreted certain ways, and so we'll just talk about it. And I'll get a lot of information that won't necessarily go in the story, but will make me more confident that the way that they're telling the story and characterizing it and the words they're using is is rings true. Um, you know, sometimes it's those, not a, a clear black and white fact, but the, the way that you're crafting a story that can um, get you in trouble sometimes. And so I'll just, it, we'll have a lot of conversations and I'll, I'll look at documents, I'll look at things, they'll, they'll send me like, uh, you know, chunks of their interviews so I can see the context of a quote, a soundbite that they're using. Um, a lot of conversation. Wow, yeah. that makes so you're you're seeing the whole picture, not just what they give you. Yeah, because radio and yeah. TV, you know, any any reporting, you're collapsing so much information in a right. short form. Even if it's a long story, it has been derived from hours and hours of interviews with other people and lots of documents, and you have to convey that in a way that people can understand and in like haiku, but it has to be haiku that rings true and is correct and not wrong. Right. Um, I always love when things are factually accurate, but wrong at the same time, which can happen, which can happen. Um, Pervez, this is an interesting question, I think, from Matina Tamba. She wants to know, um, police are clashing with journalists. She's seen that on the news. And how do people report in their home cities without becoming a target of perhaps local police? Is that something you've seen in your experience? Because those police officers are going to know your neighborhood, know you and everyone that lives with you, perhaps. Oh boy, uh, I, I don't know that I've seen, you know, journalists necessarily becoming targets of mm -hmm. police. Um, I think, I think this happens a lot where, or not a lot, but I think this happens where I think police get caught up in the moment, uh, and forget or are not trained properly to deal with journalists. I mean, I was shocked in Ferguson that we, you know, we were standing in what was essentially called the police pen they'd set it up this area and i forget what it was a parking lot of some you know uh i think it was a liquor store or whatever gas station and it didn't stop them from you know from making sure from from keeping you know projectiles from flying into in, in, into uh into the pen so uh and you know you see i mean we had an incident in minnesota where you know we had omar jimenez standing in the street reporting live on tv the National right. Guard shows up and they end up arresting him. And I mean, they end up apologizing, but like, obviously there was some level of miscommunication or uh, some just, you know, not following of duties or, or, you know, some attempt to like sort of uh, to flex their muscle unclear, but uh, in that very moment um, that led to his arrest. So yeah. yeah, if that answers the question, it's, it's not yeah. an easy one. I will say that. No, I will say in local reporting, I have seen instances in small rural counties, uh, sheriff's deputies can sometimes target reporters. That's happened in New Mexico. Uh, they just things like following you around and and kind of watching your house, things like that. And that that can be a really unsettling uh, feeling. Absolutely. If you, you know, you yeah. don't you don't want to get the sheriff mad at you. I was also. Look, I mean, this happens at the NYPD too. I don't know if T T Tina's dealt with the NYPD as well. Like you know, it's like there 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 are people that don't want to get on you know the police's bad side. If you get on the bad side, then you're not getting information, uh, or you know, or worse, you know, you might not get your press pass from you. That's pretty yeah, rare. Yeah. But like you know, you want to be on their bad side because you know you're not going to get the information. And so, I think when you're, yeah, I think when you're in a city of 
of the size of Washington DC or New York City, of course, the chance of the police, you know, finding out where you live and coming after and patrolling up and down your street. That's, that's not the same, obviously right. we don't have that problem, but I can say for sure that that was something we saw overseas a lot. I mean, this was something that local journalists overseas were dealing with on a constant basis. And it was one of some of the countries I reported on was one of the most effective ways of preventing these local journalists and sometimes their national journalists from doing their jobs. And we've obviously seen it still going on. So, and I think if I lived in a small town in the United States, obviously that would, yeah, I guess that would be a lot more of a concern. Here, I think in New York City, yeah, the biggest issue you ever had to face as a journalist, mm -hmm. it was that concern that Pervez mentioned of, uh-oh, you know, they're going to remember my name and they're not going to give me any information or what's going to happen when I go to get my NYPD press pass renewed. Um, I never, when I did see police acting what I thought was overly aggressively here, for instance, during the takedown of the Occupy Wall Street movement, right? Uh, it, that was happening at like one, two in the morning in Manhattan. And I certainly did not see situations where police were actually looking close enough in anyone's press pass to get their name or anything. It was just kind of a free for all, like you're in the wrong right. place and we're taking you in. Um, certainly, some of those reporters did end up facing charges and having to deal with the legal mess afterward. But I don't think that in a city of this size, they had to worry about police chasing them down later. This is a kind of an interesting and we can go question. To a long for Richard yeah. yeah, that's he, he wants to know if editors the role of editors changing from the traditional hierarchical model to different models, whether because um, editors are more diverse and they work differently, you know, maybe more, whatever that means. Uh, and also for any other reasons, like is the old Perry Mason get the story gone kind of thing or not Perry Mason, the guy from Superman, but you know what I mean? Is it I, I think we have, I don't know. I've only been an editor for about four years. So I, I don't know. Um, I think that it's, it's definitely a give and take. I mean, there are, are there are some assignments we just need and we, and we, we make them. Um, but, you know, I think the reporter has, unless it's a breaking news of that day, the, the reporter has a role to play in shaping that story. Right. And often, especially in beat reporting, you know, you'll say we, we want this story and the, the reporter will know a little more and say, well, actually, I think this or they'll make a phone call or two and come back and say, well, actually, here is the better story as I see it. And that's great. That's what you want. Yeah. You know. That makes sense. Um, Skylar Morales wanted to know, um, and maybe Tina can speak to this, whether the hostility that came after Donald Trump with the attack on news and journalists from officials, but also from supporters. Did people take that, feel it personally? Was that something that, you know, you feel directed at you as an individual, as opposed to the press or the media in general? Um, I would say probably most journalists now don't quite, I mean, it used to be that when you walked into a room of strangers and you introduced yourself as a journalist, you kind of knew people were going to say, oh, wow, that's a, that's a great job. That's a cool job. I, I really, I really respect that. Not so much anymore. I think people, a lot of journalists probably are a lot less inclined to publicly announce to people they don't know what they do for a living because you just no longer know what the leanings of those people are and whether they're going to come back at you with, Oh, so you're part of, yeah, you're part of that. You're part of that side of fake news. You know, right. I don't trust you people. I think that's, that's a pity. Um, I'm still proud of being a journalist. I wouldn't change a thing about my career, not one minute of it. Uh, but I do feel for younger journalists who I know are going to face decades of trying to unravel the distrust of the media that has developed so effectively over the last over the last few years. Okay, and, really, I think it's been a long decade. Yeah. It's been building for a while, and we certainly saw it building overseas when we were there. The danger toward journalists overseas. I started seeing it in Africa when I was there, getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, I never thought I'd see it as bad as it is in the United States. I tell journalists overseas now. You know, I feel like 
being in the United States as a journalist, I feel like I used to feel when I was overseas as a journalist. And now I understand exactly what those local journalists that I got to know in places like Nigeria and Zaire and South Africa in the early 90s were going through. I know exactly what it must be like. Yeah, and I think that's a, a good closing uh, note in that we are covering crisis. And uh, as a result, we have to live with not just what's happening out there, but what's happening directed at journalism. And then we have to learn to deal with it and get people, if not to trust us, at least hopefully to read and listen and to watch us so that we can make sense of all the craziness that's going on. Sandy? Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Pervez. Uh, that was a wonderful conversation. I certainly learned an awful lot. Thank you for taking the time uh, for all of you out there. Please be sure to join us tonight at 5.30 Mountain when we get in back into the art of the political cartoon with Ann Telmes and Cow. And until then, everybody have a fine day and uh, we will talk to you all soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.